In The Batman, viewers see the first ever electric Batmobile. To get this blue fire look practically, the team had to pivot to electric to avoid fires on set and put a jet intake under its hood to make it look like it was breathing. This fits right in with the Batman franchise's commitment to in-camera effects, as the films have pulled off some of the Batmobile's most impressive feats with minimal CGI. Here's how six other memorable stunts came to life. Christopher Nolan's version of the Batmobile, the Tumbler, looks like a cross between a Hummer, a tank, and a Lamborghini. And because the director was set on capturing the movie's police chase in camera, this tank-like car had to be fast and maneuverable. So the team constructed the Batmobile with side-mounted wheels and no front axle, which allowed it to pull off super tight turns, and designed its six wheels to act independently of each other, so that one could stop while the other rotated to make the car change direction on a dime. That meant this Batmobile could actually execute those sharp moves you see in the movies. It could also jump six feet in height and 60 feet in distance, and really did run over the two cop cars in this shot, a move the team practiced before the shoot. Stunt driver George Cottle trained for the police chase for months by taking the Batmobile for laps on a closed racetrack. When it came time to film in Chicago, the stunt team tracked the Batmobile with a device called the Ultimate Arm, a high-speed, high-torque robotic camera crane that could spin 360 degrees. Attached to the top of a Mercedes, this allowed them to get car-to-car -car tracking shots at speeds of up to 90 miles per hour. Despite the Tumblr's impressive specs, there was one move it couldn't do jump across the rooftops of Gotham. He's flying on rooftops! So the crew decided to do this stunt with miniatures, one three scale models of the Gotham set and Batmobile. The team replicated key details of the full-scale car on the mini remote-controlled model so that the two versions of the Batmobile would drive as similarly as possible. The model needed to drive at around 35 miles per hour, which may not sound like much, but is pretty fast for a miniature. To match the background of the miniature footage to the location in Chicago, the crew extensively photographed the entire shooting area and took detailed notes on the location's lighting. Tying it all together were the finishing touches, added digitally, including camera lens effects, CG car headlights, moving reflections, vapor plumes, and debris, like these shattering roof tiles you see as the Batmobile sticks its landing. After the location shoot in Chicago, the team had to tackle another seemingly impossible stunt for the very end of the chase, when the Batmobile makes its dramatic return through a waterfall at the mouth of the Batcave. They shot the takeoff for real on a field, but the landing was filmed on the Batcave set in the UK. There, the team made a full-scale waterfall using 12 water pumps to run 14,000 gallons of water through the set. Using huge, high-pressure nitrogen cannons, they catapulted the over two-and-a-half-ton Batmobile through the waterfall, Sands Driver. This was risky, so they used a restraining cable to stop the car right upon landing, preventing it from hurtling through the other end of the extremely expensive set. When Christopher Nolan saw that the Batmobile could jump up to 60 feet, he decided to take it a step further in the dark night. The movie's chase would involve the Batmobile jumping over another car, intercepting the Joker's grenade, and then getting destroyed in a very spectacular way. Since this would all take place in a tunnel, stunt driver George Cottle had to execute the jump perfectly. Too much height, and he'd hit the concrete above. The stunt team built a ramp at just the right height and angle that they could tow behind the other car, and created a big button for Cottle to press inside the Batmobile so that he could trigger the explosion himself. The key was timing it. He had to wait until the car was at the top of its arc, when he just began to feel it come down. The car exploded from the back, and to keep Cottle safe, it had explosion-proof gas tanks like the kind used on race cars, so that if the tanks got punctured, they wouldn't actually explode. The final installment of the Dark Knight trilogy introduces the Batwing, which serves as Batman's new ride after a bunch of tumblers fall into the hands of Bane's henchmen. This time around, the team had to make Batman's vehicle fly. And because it's a Christopher Nolan movie, they had to do it with as little CGI as possible. The special effects team built two real versions of the Bat. Both were massive, at 28 feet long and 17 feet wide. There was a lighter version that the team could lift up on cables, which were removed in post to create the illusion of flight. 
Then there was a heavier version, which weighed one and a half tons and had working guns that fired via remote control. The team mounted this bat on a truck with a hydraulic crane and drove it through the streets of Pittsburgh at 50 miles an hour. The VFX team removed the support car and crane in post. While the bat could be driven in a straight line and could even swerve, it wasn't great at going around corners at high speeds. So for those shots where the bat did especially wild maneuvers, the VFX team had to replace the practical bat with a digital replica. Selling it wasn't easy. Much of The Dark Knight Rises takes place in the daytime, unusual for a Batman movie. That, coupled with the decision to shoot the film in IMAX, meant the level of detail on the CG bat had to stand up to a super high resolution under full lighting. Luckily, the VFX artists had the advantage of new technology a physically-based ray tracing system partly developed at Pixar. Ray tracing is a technique of mapping out all the rays of light in a scene as they bounce off different objects and characters. Before, artists would have had to grade the surface of the CG bat by hand. Now, the software helped automate that process, which made it easier to mimic the shadows and highlights on every inch of the real thing. Ben Affleck's 8,800-pound 8 Batmobile took over a year to build. So how are they going to film shots like this? The team created not one, but three Batmobiles. Well, sort of. There was the real deal that Affleck drove with a full interior cockpit. Then there were two proxy cars, which they called Smashmobiles, basically stripped down Dodge Ram dualies. When any shots called for the Batmobile to collide with other objects, the filmmakers used one of the Smashmobiles instead, shooting on location in the streets of Detroit. Actually doing the stunts with a stand-in car gave the VFX artists a practical starting point. So when the VFX team digitally swapped the Smashmobile for the Batmobile in post, the action looked much more grounded. It's that commitment to practical methods that has brought this car to life again and again, and turned it into its very own character in the films. So what do you think? Does it come in black? 